To achieve a balance in your garden's ecology, you really do need to invite the whole food chain. Here at the University of Bristol Botanic Gardens, there are some ingenious methods of enticing all manner of wildlife. And I'm going to show you some simple ideas that will work a treat in your garden. As homemakers, housekeepers and gardeners, we've kind of evolved into a species that expects things to be neat and tidy inside and out. It's not the way it is with nature and it's not the way it should be. Having an area of the garden like this, just a few pieces of rotting, decomposing wood is very important for a healthy ecosystem. If you don't have room for a pile of logs, just avoid sweeping up dead leaves, as they will also be decomposed by your creepy crawlies. And they, in turn, will become food for another important garden inhabitant that you can invite with the right plants. Trees, shrubs and hedges provide great nesting opportunities for birds. Take this holly behind me, it's perfect. It's evergreen so there's cover all year round. Later in the year there's berries for food and with those prickly leaves there's protection from predators. Birds like all sorts of different plants. Sunflowers look great and their seeds are a real avian treat. Or why not plant a delightfully scented honeysuckle? Yew hedges work really well, providing shelter and nesting opportunities. And a crabapple tree is sure to attract robins with a fruit crop that can last throughout the winter. If you don't have room for big trees in your garden, but you still want to encourage birds to nest, well, give them a little bit of a helping hand. How about this, this cute little nesting box. This one has a large opening, which makes it perfect for species such as robins and wrens. And the thing about those birds is that you don't have to put the house on a wall too high. They like to be just above eye level. I'm putting this behind an evergreen shrub, an Eliagnus. But it's not only birds that need a helping hand. How about this bat roosting box? This simile is perfect for them. They enter up this way, and if you put it high up in a tree, they could be adding to the biodiversity in your garden. Here at Rosemore, they have this wonderful fruit cage to protect all this luscious fruit. However, you don't need something quite so grand to protect the berries in your garden. So I'm going to show you a simple technique that will ensure that your precious berries are safe from fruit-hungry critters. The thing about ripe, juicy berries is ultimately they're delicious and everybody wants them. So if you want your fair share, then you're going to have to protect them. Blackbirds, robins, pigeons, mice, anyone and everyone will have a go. Now I have made this lovely little raised bed for my strawberries. Now I've put some dowels in and then this is plumber's pipe. You can pick it up from any kind of plumber or DIY merchant and it makes a perfect sort of structure to put your netting over. By crossing the pipes and attaching them to the dowels, my structure is almost there. Just secure the pipes with a cable tie in the centre for added stability. So what you need next is some form of protection and that's netting. Now you can use all sorts of things, but what matters is the size of the netting. If you go and get netting which is too finely woven, you will keep out your pollinators. If you don't have pollinators, you don't get any fruit. So that detail matters a lot. Evenly layer the netting over your cage, making sure that it comes all the way to the ground on all sides. Those that are hungry for your berries will really persevere to get them. So if you leave any gaps in your netting, believe me, the blackbirds will spend a lot of time working out how to get in. So you need to make sure it's secure. Now, around my raised bed, I have just left the screws slightly proud so that I can get the netting on. And you need to pull it very taut because pigeons have a trick or two up their sleeve and they like to bang on the netting and if it's not taut enough, they literally sit on it until they can get it to the ground and then eat your berries that way. Firmly secure the netting all the way round, leaving the excess free at the back. Always requires some degree of patience getting netting right, but it's worth it in the end. I'm just going to roll up 
this excess and simply tuck it in the back. And this means I still have easy access because clearly you want to get back in to pick the fruit, maybe to do some weeding and pruning. I come to the John Innes Centre in Norwich to meet Head of Entomology, Dr. Ian Bedford, to find out more about my long-standing nemesis. Hi, Ian. Hello, Christine. There's lots of different species, aren't there? But what have you managed to collect? Yeah, we've got about 30 species of slugs in the UK. Right. Um, but only a few are actually problematic to us. You know, the ones. Okay. This tiny little black slug. The that's black... the so-and-so that does damage to potatoes, isn't it? Yep, that's yeah. the black garden slug. Then we've got a few species, actually, of keeled slugs. Oh, right. Yeah, they've got that sort of keel down the back, haven't they? Yeah, yeah. They, they look the, like the, the a, shape, an upturned, yeah. upturned boat. And then more recently, we have this invading Spanish slug, Orion vulgaris. How big can it get? Well, we've had specimens here that are growing up to 15 centimetres long. Yeah. Ye gods! Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> They're absolutely amazing. There's a lot of protein there, really. It's a shame that yeah. we can't eat them out of existence. <laughs> Poss well, it's, 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 it's a thought. Um, but, uh... Have they been introduced to the French? <laughs> <laughs> so, Ian, how do we control them? Right, well, I've got a little dem demonstration that I've set up in the lab. OK. Um, we'll go and have a look, shall we? Yeah, let's. I've asked Ian to construct a slug and snail assault course for me to put some of the nation's favourite slug deterrents to the test in a completely non-scientific experiment. Heading up my slug challenge are physical barriers like crust eggshells, abrasive grit, coffee grounds and copper strips, thought to give them an electric shock. And some can beer traps to entice them in. Left overnight under close surveillance with an unprotected leaf as a control, which of my oysters will have escaped damage? Oh, wow, look at this. Yeah, there's a bit of damage Crazy. there, isn't there? Look at that. Hmm. I mean, have they all been nobbled? No, that looks... No, that looks all right, actually. It does. Eggshells, they're supposed to be sharp and sticky and, and abrasive. That hasn't really worked. That hasn't worked. What about the old grip? I mean, if we got? We've got one, oh, dear two, Alex. three, four. <laughs> right, well, that definitely doesn't work. We've got beer. They're supposed to like beer. Shall I pull this out? Yeah, see if there's an inebriated... Not vegetables. a sausage. <laughs> no. Nothing. Oh, dear. All right, the old coffee grains. Now, they're supposed to be really successful. I mean, there's no physical damage, but that's definitely slug mm. trails, isn't it? And this is the control that's perfectly all right. I thought really something. <laughs> what could be done? I mean, this is so simple mm. that the gardener at home could pull, try this, couldn't they, and see which works in their garden? Absolutely. 